presenters tonight are Nathan Lewis, who is the uh, pastor of Evergreen Presbyterian Church, that's where we're meeting here, and uh, Bernie Daler, who is the, uh, he is a humanist minister, is that right? So if you want to get married and you don't want him to marry, you get him to marry. <laughs> please, please have him do it. <laughs> And uh, he's, he's also been uh, instrumental, I think, in, in getting uh, these meetings organized. Uh, and he has meetings like this, not only at this location, but in several other locations. So our format tonight is uh, fairly, fairly simple. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, 10 minutes, uh, and Bernie's going to have the first presentation, and then uh, Pastor Nathan will have a second presentation. They'll be discussing what are the strengths and weaknesses of your belief system. And after each of them has had a chance to give their 10-minute presentation, uh, and they also they also have a little bit of time for advertising, so Nathan can advertise whatever he wants to advertise, and Bernie can advertise whatever he wants to advertise, like Little Caesars or a, so a semiconductor manufacturer that shall remain nameless or... <laughs> and and uh, after, after they get their 10 minutes of presentation, then I'm going to ask each of them a question, and that will take up about 10 minutes, and then they'll be able to ask each other some questions. Uh, following that, then we're going to take a little bit of a break while Robert swaps out the tapes, and then we'll have a chance for question and answers from you, the audience. So be thinking your questions, and... Uh, uh, be ready to do that. And then at the close of the questions and answers, then uh, each of them will have a minute to summarize their position. And the meet, so the meeting should be over right about 8.30, uh, but the doors will not close at 8.30. My experience is that there's always a lot of people that hang around late, and there's a lot of uh, good conversation and talk afterwards, so I hope we don't have something scheduled for 8.35. So, uh, without further ado, let me take, uh, turn it over to Bernie Gaylor, and you, you have your 10 minutes now, Bernie. That's a little bit of time for intro. Yeah, that's right. You can get a minute for intro on your demons. Yeah, my name is Bernie Daler. Um, I'm 50 years old, and uh, in 2007, I got a master's in ministry degree from a conservative Baptist seminary, and then two years later, I left the faith. I'm an atheist. So I best, um, I've been an atheist for about three years now, and I really appreciate these gatherings. I attend the, because I, I, I see a lot of familiar faces. People have been coming here. Um, more than once, and I think we're trying to find the truth, and so I think it's good to have these discussions to try to get all sides of the issue. And I, uh, so I attend uh, quite a few um, um, meetups for atheists and agnostics. Um, two big ones are the Humanist of Greater Portland, which is a subgroup of the national group called American Humanist Association. There's also CFI is another national one that has a local group. And then if you go to meetup.com and put an atheist or agnostic, you'll see a whole bunch of other groups pop up, like the Flying Spaghetti Monster Lands for a Pint is one, uh, Atheist Etc. is another one, and uh, some other miscellaneous ones. So that's it for my general introduction. Okay. okay, so our topic tonight is what's the strengths and weaknesses of your belief system? So we'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to give my definition of secular humanism. I think. Uh, I'm allowed to do that, just like Christian Christianity has many different denominations, I would like to submit to you that there are um, secular humanists that would define their belief system differently. And then I'm going to also explain why I think it's the best belief system. Okay, next slide. So here's my definition. I thought about this for a long time and I tried to condense it, so every one of these words is really power packed. Secular humanism is the naturalistic belief system that promotes critical thinking and morality by using modern science and reason. So secular humanism is the name of this belief system. Naturalistic is underlined because it's positively stating what I believe, not what I don't believe. I didn't say it's not supernatural. Saying naturalistic is the same thing as saying not supernatural. So I'm putting it in a positive way instead of saying what I'm not. I'm saying what I am. Belief system just means it's a system of beliefs. Um, that it promotes, which means this is something that, this is really precious to us and something that we'd like the society to know about. What do we want to promote? What's this all about? Critical thinking is a huge thing. Um, I think it's going to help us to find the truth and avoid superstition. And I think everybody here agrees we don't want to be superstitious. So it's a matter of questioning what is superstitious and what is, what is real. So critical thinking is very important, and morality.
morality. Morality comes up a lot because this is kind of just a result of a backlash of Christians saying, well, if you're an atheist, then you have no morality. And morality is a huge topic in philosophy. So I think it's important to give an explanation for morality. So that's why those two things are up there. Uh, by using modern science and reading, uh, reason. So that's our basis for understanding things or the facts of the world. And we get those facts through uh, modern science. And reason is <coughs> philosophy. How do you reason correctly? And that's part of critical thinking. So anyway, that's, that's the whole thing there. So and I want you to hold me to that during this debate. Make sure I'm thinking critically. I'm not being superstitious or having unfounded beliefs. So next slide. Um, one expression of, of atheism would be uh, secular humanism, but there could be atheists who don't believe in God, but believe in reincarnation or other things. So atheism just says, I am not a theist. It doesn't say what you do believe. So secular humanism is actually a positive declaration of what you do believe. So you can see secular humanism as a subset of atheism. Um, and you can think of the label as describing the belief system. So here we have this belief system, and what should we call it? Let's call it secular humanism. Don't think secular humanism is defined by the words. Oh, it's secular and humanism. That means they're secular and they think humans are the greatest thing since sliced bread. That's, don't, so don't get the belief from the label. Get the label. The label just identifies the belief. So I want to make sure you, you understand that. Next slide. Oh, wait. Um, let's go back. So yeah, I already talked about that. Next slide. Um, as a philosophy, there's a philosophy called metaphysical uh, naturalism, also called philosophical naturalism. It just basically says the natural world is all we have. And that's something I ascribe to. So, and I, I think you can use that as a synonym for secular humanism. It, I would say it's uh, philosophical naturalism. Science is called methodological naturalism, which means by method you assume everything's natural. You don't say, you know, here's my hypothesis that this happens, this happens, and God does a miracle, and this happens, because you can't test that in science. So they don't allow anything supernatural in science. So everybody agrees that science is called um, methodological naturalism, but where I go further, and Pastor Nathan would say I'm wrong, is I'm saying I go into philosophical naturalism, which I say it's not just science, it's all of reality that is natural. And so some uh, Christians would... Uh, defame that as scientism, as a pejorative word. So we can talk more about that later if you want. Next, next page. Uh, so this just talks about the two major groups in Portland. And I also have um, another group that I, I'm, I'm starting to, um, just to see as an experiment to where it goes. Um, it's called Philosophical Naturalism, basically. And you go to meetup.com, that's the web link for it. Next page. <coughs> So why is secular humanism, humanism uh, superior? I would say because it's, number one, a face uh, or a search for morality. And the question is, can you, face, can you face the consequences of reality, which is going to involve facing mortality? And I think that's one thing religion does, is it wants to be in um, denial about death and trying to think about how we can live forever. So reincarnation or resurrection or something. Let's, let's come up with something. So I think... Um, Part of searching the truth is dealing with the consequences and however they fall out. And also, the theory should be built on data. You're not trying to find data to have your theory. You shouldn't say, like, well, I believe in the Bible because the Bible is true. Now let me go see what kind of science I can to back that up. Rather, we should look at all the facts and say, what makes the best um, sense of all these facts? So that way, I think that Christians who practice presuppositionalism, which means they say, well, you just got to believe something first and then... And then that's your starting point. I would say, no, you don't believe something first. You go with the facts first. Um, next slide. So why does Christianity fail? Well, I, I would like to say there's two kinds of faith. This is my own idea. There's bad faith and good faith. Good faith is based on data. We don't have all the answers, but it, it looks according to the data that we should believe this. Bad faith is, well, I just believe this, and even though the data doesn't back it up, I still believe it. And um, so I think it's really intellectually unhealthy to go against the evidence. You know, and, and same thing I think Christians do is say, well, you know, I believe it's true and I don't understand it, but someday God will figure it out. And I just say, no, just go further and accept the conclusion. Next page. So two examples of bad faith. Next page. Um, 
So I'm going to give some examples of nonsense. For example, the Catholic Church says, here's the host. The, the priest just changed it into the body and blood of Jesus. It doesn't smell like it or taste like it or anything, but it's literally Jesus. Well, if you, if you believe that, then there is nothing you won't believe because it, it contradicts every, every, sen every sense you have. And it's like the story of the emperor has no clothes. You know, finally the kid points out to his mom that the emperor has no co clothes. Yeah, that's the way it is. Um, we know that it's not literally Jesus. And the Catholics say it is, even though it doesn't look like it. Next page. And then also, um, because Christians want to believe the Bible first, a lot of them have trouble with evolution, how humans evolved from other animals. So, next page. Um, even... Even, a lot of people don't realize this, but even, you can go to Catholic.com, even the Catholic Church believes that there is a literal Adam and Eve, or first humans, that gave birth, uh, that, that's our ancestor, that's because we originated, originated original sin from them, they were the first sinners and we inherited it. A lot of people think, well, you know, Catholicism is open to evolution, and it is, but they have gone on record as saying, we still believe in a literal event, and we still believe that all humans today literally descended from one couple, and I disagree with Pastor Nathan on this, I think that has been scientifically disproven. So we can talk more about that if you want to. Next page. Oh, um, so, and also I just say the core of the gospel doesn't make sense. I mean, God's supposed to be all-knowing. He made humans, they rebelled in sin. The only way to fix this was for God to become a man and die for these sins as a substitutionary punishment. So God sacrificed himself to appease himself. It seems like the logic falls on a lot of different levels. Next page. Um, and and there's, here's uh, four reasons I give, but just because I'm out of time here soon. Uh, I'll, just, I'll, make, I'll mention one of them. Number three, it is ethically immoral to do these things. Like the modern court would never allow these. Number one, make children accountable for the crimes of their parents. We would never do that. But it, the Bible says that, you know, original sin, we're all guilty of what somebody else did. Number two, punish an innocent man for the crime of others. For example, Jesus. That doesn't make any sense uh, through ethics. Next page. So anyway, this is, um, again, my, my definition of secular humanism. And I'm saying, if it sounds like a superior belief system, you can upgrade. Just like buying a new computer, just, just upgrade. So that's it. Thank you. My advertisement. Good evening. Welcome to Evergreen Church. Uh, we are not having a debate here tonight. If you've been to the Religion Forum before, you know that we're trying to make space here among neighbors to have friendly conversation and the building of long-term relationships with people who believe precisely the opposite. So, Bernie just can't get over it. He keeps quoting me, and I take... And I'm not complimented that he keeps quoting me before I say anything. But the real winners here tonight, beyond Little Caesar's Pizza, <laughs> is you. Because Charlie and I, who communicate quite a bit to, with each other as we serve in this church, we did not communicate about the purchasing of the pizza. So I went to Little Caesar's on Allen, and I bought the pizza. And Charlie went to Little Caesars on Mars and bought pizza. <laughs> so before you leave tonight, would you go back to the kitchen? And if you really think that you need to take a pizza home, would you? Because there's a lot of pizza back there. <laughs> Just take it home, and then I will feel better about it. <laughs> okay. Somebody so, was multiplying the pizza when you were That's later. right. Yeah. yeah, this is a, yeah, a little bit like the multiple of loaves and fishes. <laughs> so that's my advertisement. Little Caesars won tonight. I hope you all got enough pizza and there's more for you to take home. Um, now also, I, I, was, I was hoping that tonight, and maybe we can do it during the Q&A, that we could try to be a little bit more open than we have been in the past. And I don't mean we as the, the religion forum, but we as fellow human beings. How open are we truly? For example, why didn't Bernie this evening tell us what he believed are the strengths of atheism and the weaknesses of atheism? 
Uh, and why should I not do the same for Christianity? How open-minded am I? Or how open-minded are you? Um, so, but I, I am going to give to you what, you know, there's so many strengths of Christianity. Um, and there's so many weaknesses. I, if you're interested, later on, I've, I've made a list. I've made four lists. The strengths and the weaknesses of Christianity, two lists. And the strengths and weaknesses, as I see them, of atheism. So uh, we'll just go from there. The strengths of Christianity, as I see them, uh, and the ones that I've chosen uh, for this particular discussion tonight, first um, is its inherent graciousness. Um, the, the scripture is full of statements about God's graciousness. And this is because God is infinitely just, and he must punish sin. But God has also made a way to be merciful toward us who deserve his just punishment. And so God gives to us what we do not deserve. This is central and bedrock uh, to the biblical narratives. And it is what we call the gospel of Christianity. That through Jesus Christ, our Savior, God gives to us what we do not deserve. Uh, forgiveness of our sins. Uh, actually, the atonement of our sins. The complete removal of our sins. And, and eternal fellowship with, with God. And so, this, uh, this freedom from ourselves is at the heart of Christianity. This liberation from all of our bondage, as the Apostle Paul says, everything that entangles us. This central core uh, gospel is, uh, I believe, a strength of Christianity. A second one is uh, Christianity's certain hope. Uh, if, if you have used the word hope in English for some time, you have most likely used it as a synonym for wish or individual desire. But in the scripture, hope has a certainty to it, uh, and for this reason primarily that God is a God who has made many promises uh, to his creatures, and he keeps those promises. Uh, some of those promises he has already kept in Christ Jesus, who has died on the cross once for all. He has completed work for us so that we might have favor with God. And so the Christian has a certain hope in that work that Jesus has done on her behalf. And, and so uh, from that certain hope, we cling to the promises of God yet to be fulfilled. And we believe them to be fulfilled in the future. This gives the Christian a psyche, a spirit, a lifestyle that is uncanny when put up against some other kinds of belief systems. Uh, we actually have a hopeful outlook on the future. And you're saying, well, I know a lot of curmudgeon Christians <laughs> who have a dark view of the future. And I'm here to tell you, they only have a dark view of your future, <laughs> not their future. <laughs> and so here's a third strength of Christianity, as I see it. Uh, it's abiding joy. I'm not talking about momentary or surface happiness. I'm talking about something that is deep within the soul of a, of a Christian. And so no matter what kind of crises, what kind of trial or challenge or problem befalls that Christian, there is a joy inexpressible in her heart that cannot be shaken. And if you've ever spoken to a Christian, especially a Christian going through a, a severe trial or crisis, that Christian will try to explain that to you because that Christian is bolstered by it. And uh, so, so foreign and radical is that joy that those who have not experienced it will say, you must have taken some kind of medicine or you must be so brainwashed that you are just living on this brainwashing that you've been given for so long. Uh, but as a Christian, I'll tell you that it is truly a gift from God. It's an assurance of my faith that gives to me this deeper joy. It is an unfailing trust in God who will make all things right 
that gives to me this joy, and it's unshakable. And uh, I, I am not one unique in, in having that joy. And then, uh, fourthly, uh, a strength of Christianity is its historic uh, institutional integrity. And I don't mean that all of our organizations have always been above board. What I mean by institutional integrity is that for millennia, Christianity has established schools, hospitals, and charities who have done a tremendous amount of work and good around the world. This, this is indisputable, and it is, it is yet to be replaced historically with any other faith system. Any other belief system has institutionalized to this extent for the good of people outside of its membership. And then fifthly, uh, the church's uh, evangelical zeal is a great strength to Christianity. Uh, Christians from every language group on the planet are so excited and so committed and devoted to Jesus that they tell everyone about it. So how much time do I have, moderator? Uh, you've used up a little over half your time, so... Oh, good. So I need a lot of time for the weaknesses of atheism. Let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> Bernie, one of the weaknesses of atheism, right off the bat, is its philosophical negativity. And Bernie has tried to give to you a definition tonight that is ultra-positive. There's just some real problems with the... He told you it was his definition, and I believe it, that that is just his personal definition. For example, naturalism. Naturalism is one of the darker philosophies ever cooked up by humanity. Go, just read Wikipedia. Read Wikipedia on naturalism. If you really want a full, rich presentation of naturalism, and you want it in an entertaining fashion, read Jack London. Jack London's fictional novels will give to you, they're all based on naturalism. It is dark. It is hopeless. It is the root and foundation for despair. So there's nothing, when we say naturalistic, uh, I know what Bernie wants it to mean tonight, but that's not what it means in any other field where anyone practices. It means fatalism. Not religious fatalism, but it means fatalism without a person to blame as the fate. Who do we blame for the fatalism? Nature. Science. And so, um, secular humanism is a nice, positive veneer put on atheism. Atheism is philosophically negative. And then secondly, atheism is religious reactionism. Atheism has not put forth in any formal academic uh, presentation anything positive for us to consider as a faith or belief system. All of its points are reacting to all the other faith systems in the world. Well, if the faith system has a deity, has a personal deity. So, um, what's really interesting is that there is one faith system in the world that is atheist that does have a moral system that has been developed and practiced, and that is Buddhism. Uh, but there is no other, to date, there is no other codified religious belief system that is atheist that has a moral system. And uh, one of the reasons for that is my third weakness that I see in atheism, and that is its worship of individualism. Atheism not only promotes individualism, but it worships individualism. And this is why a moral system, a moral code, will never be agreed upon by atheists. Uh, there, is, there is no collectivism that is held together by some outside glue. Uh, all of us as Americans have a good amount of individualism in us. Atheism <clears throat> worships individualism. So I come here and I say as a Christian, this is what Christianity largely says. And I say as a minister of the gospel, I am held accountable 
to the elders I serve under, one of them is Charlie, and a whole system in my region called the Presbytery, and nationally, by a general assembly, I'm held accountable. But as an atheist, Bernie can come here tonight and say, hey, I have cooked up a individualist, personal definition of secular humanism for you. And it's really positive. And he gets to do that because atheism worships individualism. The reason why is that there's nothing else to worship. And in this creation, in this nature, in this universe, there's nothing more beautiful, more complex, more worship-worthy, if there's no God, than the human race, than self. And so I'm going to worship self. I'm going to worship individualism so that you don't think I'm selfish. I'm not going to say self. I'm going to say individualism. And then, am I out now? You're out now. Can I just mention two more weaknesses? Quickly. Number four, atheism's worship of rationalism. Welcome to the postmodern world. No more modern science. It's all postmodern science now. It has been since 1972. And number five, uh, it's lack of social awareness. Most of the atheists that I have met are mean, rude, angry, in my face. Bernie's an exception. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, for, my, for my first question here, I'm going to ask each of you the, the same question. And that is, uh, uh, we, we heard Bernie extol the, the, what it, the benefits of atheism, and the strong points of atheism, and the weak points of Christianity. We heard Nathan extol the strong points of Christianity and weak points of atheism. But I'd like to have Bernie tell me, tell me what, what do you think are the weak points of atheism? And I'd like Nathan to tell us what the, he believes the weak points of Christianity are. So you want to, which one of you wants to go first? I can go with that. Go ahead. Go ahead, Bernie. Um, and, and make sure we have equal time, too. So how much time do you want to give each one of us? Well, why don't you, why don't you set, you, you, you give yourself a couple, uh, one or two minutes. Okay, just maybe two minutes. Okay. Um, it's very difficult for me to find a weakness with atheism because I think it's true. So, um, the one that I've come up with, you know, thinking about this, one of them that I've come up with, um, I think a weakness is when it comes to explaining a certain miracle. Now, I think most miracles in general do not have, uh, they're, you know, they're like, for example, Benny Hinn's on TV doing miracles, and other Christians say it's all fake. Show me your, like, the Hank Hanegraaff, he's the Bible answer man. He says uh, Benny Hinn's a fake healer. He's a charlatan. And he supposedly asked for evidence and said they're all wrong and all this stuff. So there's, there's no fakers doing these miracles all over the place. Uh, so miracles are easy to write off as anecdotal evidence, just personal stories people have or stories of, you know, a friend of a friend had this and they're really good sounding stories. So the only, the only one that's perplexing to me is I once knew a person um, who said he went to a healing thing and he had one leg longer than the other one and he it grew and he personally so it wasn't a story of a story like most people but that's that's his story and you know I don't know what his leg was or anything but that's the only thing that I can't explain so that's the only problem I have uh, but you know it's like is that the only miracle I mean if, if it's true if that really is true is that the kind of business God's are doing it's just doing a leg here or there uh, because nothing else, there's no evidence anywhere else on the miracles. I don't dismiss miracles out of hand. I just say there's no evidence to believe them. Um, and I've seen people lie about them and try to mislead you. Them. Like Benny Hinn. I've never, he's famous as a faker, and a lot of Christian pastors won't even uh, warn their flock about it because they're probably afraid their parishioners are giving money and they don't want to lose members, I think. So, anyway. Okay. And Nathan? Uh, what do you think are the uh, weaknesses of Christianity? Well, yeah, I've, I've identified three. And uh, unlike Bernie, I don't hold these as perceived weaknesses. I believe that Christianity is a following of the truth, of the gospel revealed uh, through, through God. But I don't believe that these weaknesses I'm going to share with you are perceived. Uh, I, I believe they're truly weaknesses. And one is uh, Christianity's denominational divisions. 
in worldwide 15,000 plus denominations. Um, just think of how strong and influential Christianity would be if it was uh, a monolithic organization. Um, and then uh, a second one is um, Christianity's 20th century reliance on an American consumerist culture. Uh, this is being corrected now because the new Christian continent is Africa. And so some of the shining brightest lights of the past 15 years in Christianity have not been Americans. But one of the weaknesses with Christianity still worldwide is that it has bought in to a lot of trite, selfish, American consumerist ideals and practices. And so uh, many Christians go to church to, to be entertained. And if it's not entertaining and they haven't taken something away uh, for themselves real practically every Sunday, they get bent out of shape where they just don't go or they'll go someplace else. And this has bled throughout the world, unfortunately. But it's being corrected because the Africans are not that way. And the South Americans are not this way. And they're the true new leaders in a huge, burgeoning Christian movement that uh, you, you just need to, you need to get out of this American bubble and see. It is an amazing worldwide movement right now. Uh, but another weakness is that we, the church has a wide open front door. So wolves in sheep's clothing can join us, like Benny Hen. Uh, yeah, I will warn you against him. He's a charlatan. But I will tell you this. The miracle I'm waiting for is Bernie Daywood to become a Christian. Now, that is a <laughs> There's a lot of hypocrites in the church. The door is wide open. So uh, that, that actually leads me to uh, uh, another question. And that is, uh, so you talked about the, the miracle you're waiting for Bernie Daly becoming a Christian. So um, yeah. Yeah. The, the question I have, my next question is, uh, Bernie shared with you a little bit of his uh, deconversion story. Is that, would that be a fair statement of, did I share it? You shared that you used to be a Christian. You didn't, tell, you didn't right. share your story, right, but right. you shared the fact. Right, right. You shared the, the facts that mm -hmm. you used to be a, a professional Christian. You're not right. no longer, but you didn't share right. your story. But uh, so my question to you, to each of you, is: um, Does Bernie's the fact that he used to be a professing Christian and is now uh, a professing atheist, or if? There were a if Bernie were to become a Christian again, or if someone else who was a professing atheist were to become a Christian, would I, do either of those things increase the credibility of? So, is the fact that you used to be a Christian now become an atheist? Does that increase the credibility of atheism? Or if some atheist became a Christian, would that increase the credibility of Christianity? Well, it seems to me the flow is not even the, between the two groups. It seems to me that more Christians are leaving than. Uh, more Christians leading belief than there are non-believers or atheists going into Christianity, so it's not an equal revolving door. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I want to say, too, uh, when I say I was a Christian, uh, Christians have two ways of handling that. One, one way is like, oh, you never were a Christian. The other one is you still are a Christian, but you're a backslider. So <laughs> they have two choices to pick from. So if I became a Christian again, I was just backsliding, you might say. You know, something... I believed it. I, you know, you talk about the peace and all that. I felt like I, I experienced all that. So, but does the fact that does does the fact that you used to be a Christian does that in, should that increase our our? To, to yeah. show that, does I that, don't I don't think that is a big point. But I think the big point is the flow is going one way more than the other way. I think that is important. Okay, so so you you you, you would say that uh, although your particular story does does not should not sway us one way to the fact that the flow is more in one direction. Yeah, especially the more advanced societies that are more educated, like America, the non-believer ranks are growing, and you might say where the where Christianity is growing are more third world countries or you know developing nations. Maybe. Yeah, I don't I don't think conversion adds credibility to one faith system or the other. I will say that um, you know statistics are. We think, you know, statistics are hard pulled facts, but all of them are interpreted for us. So, yes, in North America, I do think that there's a, a steady stream of, of uh, individuals leaving uh, the organized church, and some of them are becoming atheist or agnostic. Um, I, 
I doubt that if you put the, the church growth rate up against the atheist growth rate, it would be that much different. But I don't know. Uh, it just depends how you do your statistics. Uh, yeah. okay. But I, I don't I don't assign a lot of credibility to it. And 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 you want you want to respond to it, what Bernie, Bernie said that the fact that Christianity is growing in places that are in, in the third world and that atheism is growing. Developing nations. Is the best way. Developing nations. Same thing. <laughs> developing nations and the, and atheism seems to be growing in in the. Uh, or developed nations, do you think that uh, adds any credit? How would you respond to that? Well, I, I think that um, in developing nations, there uh, is a lot of uh, mission work being done by the churches in, in First Nations. And so uh, there also seems to be a, a movement of the Holy Spirit uh, that uh, is, is quite mobile. And it goes from place, the Spirit goes from place to place as He wills. And so right now it's South America and Africa. So it's it's the business of the Holy Spirit of God uh, where the church is going to grow and, and merge in. It's not a matter of human will. Um, it's a matter of, uh, if, if we do a little bit of historic analysis, we see that as, as an empire uh, develops and peaks and calcifies and begins to break apart, that uh, that kind of a human enterprise uh, usually uh, loses its moorings and uh, slips into agnosticism again. So, uh, you know, you take the Roman Empire. It was Constantine's Christian Empire, and uh, and uh, it, it just really went downhill from there. Okay, quick comment go right ahead. Just, just one quick comment, too. I think in the developing nations, specifically Africa, I think they're highly superstitious, and so when Christianity moves in there, they have a serious problem with uh, Christian scammers, for example, the ones who teach prosperity, if you give, you know, 10% or more or whatever, God is going to bless you, and the fake healings, and plus mixing with voodoo and all this stuff. I know one pastor who says it's a huge problem, and he has a ministry going down to Africa trying to teach them the Bible-based beliefs, and he's talking about how, because of superstition, they're, they're just as rampant. Okay, now we come to the, the part in our uh, dialogue here where uh, Nathan will ask Bernie some questions, Bernie will ask Nathan some questions. We didn't agree ahead of time who's going to ask first. Is, uh, okay. Either one. Either one. Which, which one of you wants to? I'll go alphabetically first, Bernie. Okay. <laughs> okay, how much time is this? Five minutes? Uh, five minutes each. Okay, so I think the way we do this before, I, I think, is a good way is if it's an interactive thing. So hopefully right. you don't ask one question and get a sermon and response. So it's time to be interactive. And the person asking the questions is in the driver's seat. And then when we switch, they get the chance. Okay, so um, I have a little dialogue here. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Well, Jesus died on the cross as uh, the human representative to be the target of divine justice, divine wrath for human sin. But why does dying on the cross do that? Why, why is that the solution? Um, the, the system that God had set up from, from the beginning was a system of sacrifice. What was the beginning? Well, the, the first sacrifice that's in the, in the scripture is alluded to in the Genesis text. For sin? Uh, yeah, where God covered Adam and Eve with the animal skins. And uh, to do that, he had to kill those animals. Did he say this, killing these animals and giving the skins were, uh, was a sacrifice for your sin? Yeah, there's biblical allusions after that to that being the first covering of sin. Okay, so you believe there's a literal Adam and Eve that we all descended from? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Here's my, here's my suggestion, tell me what you think about it. I think Moses came up with the idea, the sacrificial system, and he got it from the neighboring ancient, the neighboring communities there. The idea is that we have these calamities, there's a wrathful God, he's upset with us for something, let's kill a virgin or an animal, and you know, the pure animal or a virgin or whatever, they sacrifice people sometimes, and so he based, this is just a human instinct to try to, to appease this God, angry God, they thought. And so Moses just copied it from the neighbors. That's my theory. What do you think of that? Well, I think that uh, if you have a theory and you want to 
scientifically take that theory to the point where you can say this is truly a fact, then you have a lot of work to do. And you can borrow from what work has been done before, but you're going to have to be a good researcher to do that, to be able to term, determine what is responsible research as opposed to irresponsible research. Okay. You have a lot of work to do. You just can't, we can't just be flippant with these important issues in our life and just say, hey, I think Moses cooked this up when he was in Egypt looking at the sacrificial systems of Egypt. That's a good hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Now, there, I, I know that there are okay. scholars who have, have, have right. dedicated right. their whole life to this. Okay, so that's kind of a topic I don't want to go down. It's, oh. a, it's a, a longer topic, but I wanted to say, though, just at the root of the whole thing, though, I would, I would maintain that's a scientific fact that we did not literally descend biologically from an Adam and Eve. And so, if it's true that we did not descend from Adam and Eve, would you say your theology is all wrong then? No. What I, what I can tell you, Bernie, is I, can, I, I just want to remind you to go back to reading about the progress of research on the genome research. And, and what the genome research of recent years has shown is that there could be as few as 1,800 couples, original couples, from which all of us have sprung. Some of you, some of you atheists here, and I think nationally, have very quickly said, look, it can't be one couple. But what you have to realize is that all of the, the, the gene research prior to what Fred, what, what's the guy, the Christian? Francis Collins. Yeah. Francis Collins, uh, serving President Obama, came up with was all of, all of the research prior to that was saying there are thousands upon thousands, if not millions, of couples and sites. And the genome research of recent years has said, no, it's actually a very narrow gate. And now if you read what's been said in the last two or three years, is that it could be even narrower than the first genome council said. You're, you're reading, you're, 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 you're grabbing something really quick okay. and you're running with it and you're okay. saying it's a fact and it's a flimsy hypothesis. Okay. I, I just want to submit to you and to other people out there, according to the theory of evolution, animals evolve in, within a population and over time. So there is just no way that you would have the first human popping out of a non-human animal, same with the male and then also a female, and those two get together, and somehow these offspring are something totally different than their parent. Uh, Richard Dawkins in his book, The Magic of Reality, tries to go in depth about this, giving him at least two analogies to show that that's just not the way it works. Right. So. And once again, I, would, I don't count Richard Dawkins to be, you know, if I'm going to research this, I'm not going to give much credibility to Dawkins because it's been over 30 years since Dawkins has practiced his science. He has been at Oxford as a promoter, as a minister of secular humanism to okay. promote this. He has not done credible science or published it for over 30 years. Also, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to bring him in because he is a mean, rude atheist. <laughs> And I have a okay. problem with that, okay, so it's hard for me to read him. Okay. I'm going to go find a kind researcher. Okay. <laughs> so, do I have more time? Or do I, have? I think it's better. Okay. So it's Nathan's right. chance to go. Oh, okay. So, Bernie, um, in your definition of secular humanism, you've said that it's a belief system that promotes critical thinking. Now, critical thinking is an educational term that has been owned for, for centuries um, in, in, uh, in Western civilization. It has developed through Christian education. It's developed through classical education. Can you explain to me how then it becomes a unique pillar in your definition for secular humanism? The reason why I, say, uh, the reason why I chose that is because it's so precious for understanding the truth. I mean, there are other things that are important too, like uh, in other debates people say, what about love? Love is important. But for me, in my definition, I'm trying to, to just, like, just like when you have the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's all about sin and Savior, but it doesn't say everything. There's, there's so many other things that are entailed. 
The same with secular humanism. There's a whole bunch of details, but I tried to distill it down to some of the major elements. Just like you would say Christianity is all about sin and savior, I'm trying to say, if I distilled secular humanism down, what's it all about? Are you not, what was your question again? Did I miss it? Well, yeah, I, th I think, well, oh, okay. when, when, if I'm going to define my belief system, I'm going to try and find that which is distinctive, unique. Okay, right. Critical thinking is not terribly unique to the atheist okay. belief system. There's only one thing that's really super unique in there that a Christian would object to, and that is natural. Because as a Christian, you believe in the supernatural. Other than that, yes, we agree critical thinking is highly important. So we agree to the rest of it. We agree that um, you know we should use science and reason. Uh, so that's our only disagreement: is supernatural versus natural. Okay. And then I, I'm just having trouble with the definition because uh, I mean we've lived a good long time now in a postmodern world. So by modern science, are you saying that you are only interested in science that has uh, been practiced and published before 1972? By modern science, I mean modern is kind of a superfluous. You don't really need to say modern. I mean, I should just say science, but it's kind of like uh, in response to young earthers who say, well, we believe in science too, but the earth is 6,000 years old. No, that's not modern science. That's your creation science. You try to come up with your own kind of science to fit the Bible. So that's kind of a, a word in there to say modern science, basically. That, that was right, so point. I just say you, you've probably uh, chosen and, the wrong word. Well, that, and, and see also, it's not just younger. I mean, there's younger creationists who are way off on science. And then getting a little closer is the older creationists. And then you got a little closer intelligent designers. Then you have evolutionary creationists. And these guys are 100% in agreement with modern science. But most of the evangelical Christians are probably older or younger creations, so they have a huge problem with science. So by putting modern science there, I'm, I'm kind of thinking. Right. There. So, for example, Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, is a good example of a postmodern scientist. He has not done his own research. He is talking about ideology and theory. He's talking about the religion of science. This would have never happened in 1952. It, it began to happen in the early 70s, and now the cat is way out of the bag and scratching all over the surface. And now in 2012, Dawkins doesn't have to do any scientific experiments at all. He doesn't have to study. He can be a theorist, an idealist. He can be a promoter of a, of a religious system and, and retain his, his title as science Scientists, because this is a postmodern world. Do you have a question? <laughs> Do I have to ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll ask you about reason then, since I'm just going through the definition. Um, what, what is the rationalist system that you're referring to when you say reason? Reason is just modern philosophy. Um, in fact, I'm teaching a, a class at the Humanist of Greater Portland, and they were and in this class we're going over uh, four logical fallacies that help us in deductive logic. So uh, like one of the three major parts of uh, philosophy, you might say, there's, it says there's one formal deductive logic and there's also informal, which is uh, induction, and the other one's called abduction. And so these are just philosophical ways to, to understand the nature of reality. In philosophy, they call it epistemology. It's a whole field. You know, also in philosophy, they have other categories, such as ethics, that's a whole category, politics. So, reasoning is just uh, epistemology and trying to figure out how we know things. How to make sure we have good thinking and, and have a good mechanism for thinking. Right. So, are you, are you trained in classical logic? Uh, not, not trained as far as I have a degree in it, though. No, but have you ever taken a class in logic, in Western logic? Uh, just in philosophy in general, I listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of reading, just personal stuff. I haven't taken courses in it. Right. So you're not, are you up on all the different logical fallacies? You can recite them and practice them well, and identify them? Like the class that I'm leading, there's 24, but there's a lot more than 24. People basically come up, I mean, logical fallacies have been identified because they're in use. It's like, there's something wrong with this argument. What is it? Oh, that's a straw man argument. You're not really attacking the argument, you're 
you're attacking some misrepresentation of it that's easy to burn down. And so they, they say, let's call it the straw man you know, fallacy. So there's all these different things people identify and they put a label on it. Right. So when, when you say here the logic of Christianity fails, you're saying according to Western formal logic, Christianity fails at, it, at these points. Well, yeah, I mean, some of it is so obvious. I mean, like I said, the Catholic thing, this wafer is supposed to be a literal body of blood of Jesus, even though it doesn't smell, taste, or anything like it. It's like, it, 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 it teaches you not to think. You can't use your brain, because your brain says this is bread, and it says, no, no, it's literally Jesus. So, but I agree with you on that, so. I agree with you on that particular teaching of that particular church. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this time we're going to take a, a short break while Robert swaps out the tapes. Try, try to come up with a, a, a short, succinct, clear question. And you can, you can either address the question to Nathan or to Bernie, or you can have to take the same question at, at, and address it to, to both of them. And I'll just take uh, take hands. So, uh, any hands? Right here, please. So my question is for Pastor Lewis. So if I were to summarize both of your original 10-minute presentations, I would say that Bernie really focused on um, evidence and critical thinking and logic and pointed out the specific weaknesses of Christianity with regards to evidence and the strengths of atheism with regards to evidence and logical thinking. Whereas yours had a lot more to do with the philosophical and even psychological appeal of Christianity. It gives us hope, it gives us joy, atheism is dark, and they list it, and atheists are mean. So I know that you're a presuppositionalist, and you think that the Holy Spirit has a lot to do with your faith. Um, but you also believe that God has revealed himself through the world around us. So based on historical and scientific evidence, regardless of psychological and philosophical appeal and the work of the Holy Spirit, would you say that Christianity makes more sense of the world around us than does atheism? Absolutely. And the reason why is, in one word, relationship. All of the points that I, I, I put forth as strengths of Christianity are all rooted in a relationship with God, which allows us to have relationships with each other. And I think that is distinctive of Christianity or of uh, theist religions. And the reason why I don't think that that gives sort of a flimsy foundation when it comes to evidence is that scientific evidence is not just this pure mass of data out here that speaks for itself. It is always taken in by human beings and presented. So there is just as much human hands-on manipulation of scientific data as there ever is of a relationship. So it's not as if Christianity or presuppositional Christianity is soft on evidence, but this belief system over here is strong because it has science. Every bit of science that you have ever interacted with has come through a large amount of human uh, interpretation and presentation. And there's no way to get around that. You cannot go to Multnomah Falls and look at the water and tell me that's the evidence. Because you have to take it in, analyze it, evaluate it, then present it as evidence. So you would say that evidence is subjective rather than objective? No, I, I think that those are not mutually exclusive ever in our, in our life. For example, when, when Bernie tells you, just look at the facts, <coughs> you have to interpret facts. Right. When, when he says that I, as a presuppositionalist, believe this is the truth before I have facts, that I say this is true and then I gather facts, everyone on the planet from the beginning of time to the present, does that. Uh, the difference is whether or not I say I've got a hypothesis that I'm going to go gather facts for. But there's always a hunch, a belief, a hypothesis first. There is always pre-thinking 
And then there's the gathering of facts, and that's not the end of it. If you have ever gathered facts, you know that that's never the end of it. That's just the end of perhaps a cycle. And then you've got to go back and do it again. The reason why is we are finite creatures, and we will always have to dig and dig and dig. Can I have a quick yeah, comment? Yeah, I agree with Pastor Nathan that we all have a bias that we look at data with. Um, but what we need to do is look at the facts and build the best theory based on those facts. And that's, that's why I left Christianity. Uh, in, Christian, in Christianity, there's different levels of science. The more you believe the Bible, literally, the more you have problems with science. And this is the young earth creationist position. As you learn more science, you become an older earth creationist. This is what most evangelical Christians are, young earth and older earth creationists. Once you accept evolution, and all the implications, which I don't think Pastor Nathan is there yet, until you understand that there was no Adam and Eve, this is what Professor Dennis Lamoureux says in Canada, he's a Christian evangelical, he says there is no Adam, just like there is no firmament. The firmament is an ancient cosmological model, which has, is not true. So, once you, once you become an evolutionary create, uh, creationist, then there's no problems with science whatsoever. And now you get into a more of a mystical thing, and I didn't want to go there. But so I, so I think the problem Nathan has with science is not yet accepting the fact, the consequences, that there was no Adam and Eve. Um, so I'll leave it there. Let me just, if I, can, if I may, um, I, I don't have much problem with science. Uh, but what I want you to hear are the first words that Bernie said when he just spoke. He said, when I look at the facts, that's what I'm trying to say. There is something that's happening before these facts are not these autonomous maverick presentations out here. Bernie said, when I look at the facts, and none of us can escape that. that that's, that's what maybe some of us are missing, is what happens when what, is, what are those words describing <clears throat> when I look at the facts? Okay, another question. Uh, how about right here? Uh, I always like to prefer the young ones. Mr. Nathan, um, you believe in Noah's Ark, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, so, so when so God told Noah to get all the animals and put them on the ark, right? No, not all of them. Okay. Like all the aquatic animals, well, they, they just had to swim their way around. <laughs> okay. So then it says in the Bible that the, it, the flood went over the highest mountains of the world. And that includes Mount Everest, right? No. Well, I, I don't know about that. Okay, but even if, there, if it did, then the animals could not breathe because there's no oxygen up there. Yeah, you know... Uh, you're, you're Bernie's boy, right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, <laughs> so, like, your dad can tell you about how those mountains were formed. The question is, when were they formed? So, you know, you have tectonic plates. Have you ever been to the steams here in southeastern Oregon? Uh, I don't think so. Take, make sure your dad takes you there. Because <laughs> you see this big plate just come right up out of the, the flatness of the earth. It just goes bam, like that. And then there's these huge, jutting, high elevation peaks and these caverns, uh, uh, you know, these uh, canyons. It's beautiful. Everest came out. Everest, Everest is relatively young um, for dates. And, and, you know, you and I can get into all the dating and how old the Earth is and all that. But Everest is young because it's jagged and tall. That's about what I know. Okay, but it didn't, well, it took longer than 2,000 years to form. Well, I agree with you on that. Not everyone in the room who's a Christian will agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. But I do think that it's probably longer than 2,000 years. Can I have a quick comment? On sure. That? Okay. <laughs> uh, you can have a comment after me. At home, too. Yeah. Um, the Bible literally says that the highest mountain was covered, I think, by over 100 feet. Why is that? Well, because if it wasn't, the humans, you know, the animals wouldn't have been killed. God's design was to kill the animals. It says in there it was to kill all the land breathers, all the air breathers. So anything that had the breath of air in its lungs was going to get destroyed. Um, sometimes young earth creationists think, oh, well, you know, yeah, those mountains were created just really quick, boom. They, they weren't that high back then, like 
like like he said, you know, there's no oxygen up there that was that covered up that high. Um, so sometimes they say, uh, well, maybe the mountain just after the flood, the mountain just did that real quick. But when you understand the plate tectonics, I mean, if, if the Earth moves by just a tiny amount, you have massive earthquakes. And so here you're saying, forget about that, just magnify by a billion. That's what happens. You know, all these land masses move and everything. It's a matter of months. You know, so it's 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 a huge conflict with modern science. Now again, the evolutionary creationists, they'll say, hey, we have no problem with it, but we accept science 100%. Of course Noah's Ark is a myth. It's not there to teach you science or even be a historical story. It's there to teach you a theological truth. It's a story to teach you something about sin and all that. So if you're that kind of a Christian, there's no conflict with science. But if you're a young earther or old earther, and you believe in a, a worldwide flood, I mean, even a local flood, the old earthers say there's a local flood, just a local area. That doesn't make sense either. There's no sense in saving birds that could easily fly a shelter. You know, so I mean, there's, there's all these problems with science. Okay, right here, Mr. Southridge. <laughs> okay, so Pastor Lewis, you stated that you literally believe in Noah's Ark, right? Yeah. So yeah, Noah's Ark landed on one mountain. Yeah, I, I believe that's the way the story goes. And all the animals came out. And so what we would expect from that story is that all the animals would be distributed across the world evenly from that point. Okay? But we have mountains, we have monkeys, I'm sorry, that we only find in Madagascar. They're in no, no other place in the entire world. So all of them got off the ark hiked down to Africa, jumped over 500 <laughs> miles of water, and uh, landed in Madagascar, instead of spreading evenly across the world. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you'll find anything in the biblical text that tells you that all the animals left Noah's Ark and spread out like that. You're assuming that from the text. What, what we don't know is what else happened to develop all these different species. What we do know is that uh, different species, uh, there, there's more than we know of even today that we've discovered. And we don't know all, all of their historic uh, genetic trail. Yeah, but you know, to tell you the truth, I haven't thought that much about it because uh, my read of that, of that text is, um, and, and this is how nearly all ancient literature is, it's from the perspective of the main character in the story. So Noah is on the ark, and what does he see? It's described for you there, what he saw. It, it, Noah wasn't a scientist telling you all of this information from a laboratory or from a genus chart. But this is what I saw from the deck of the boat. And if you read it that way, it's quite plausible. And your brother's got a question. Yes, I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, earlier, I just want to confirm that you said that you believe for a fact that Adam and Eve started the human race. Is that true? Well, I, I believe that God started the human race. That With he Adam created, Eve. yeah, that he created first Adam, and then he created Eve. From, okay. Yeah. So, uh, now, in the scripture, did Adam and, so in order for them to start the human race, they surely must have had some children. Well, some are listed in the scripture. Now, uh, quite quickly, could you remind us of their children? Well, the first one that's that's named is Cain. Cain. Yeah. And he's a male. He's a male. Okay. Are there other children? Oh, I'm sure there were a lot more children. Uh, there was also a, a brother, Abel. Okay. And then the next brother that's listed is Seth. Okay. Is that all the children that they had? No, I I assume not because. In, once again, in ancient literature, oftentimes, when, if, a, if a female progeny is listed by name, we're supposed to pay attention because the the, the ancient tribal cultures were, uh, you know, paternal. But in this culture, it was okay to say, "Marry your sister." Mm -hmm. Oh, I assume so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I. See, once again, what, what the, this is usually a difficulty for Christians. 
who try to superimpose upon ancient tribes uh, a Christian uh, morality and ethic. Um, and so then they, it, it's, it's sort of a blaming of God. How, why would God give to us these rules, but they're not to be followed at the beginning? So, so your hypothesis that there was an original man and woman, and they had kids, and all the kids came from their kids, so there was no interbreeding with anything outside of their family then, just to clarify. Well, I, I don't know what the alternatives are, except to have, as Francis Collins just said, 1,800 couples. Right. Well, presumably they could have been 900 or 400. Yeah, that's right. But if there was 800 <laughs> couples, that means no have any... Well, I, I think that there's... Uh, I'm, I'm not a geneticist, I'll tell you that much, right? I'm a, I'm a, a, a minister of the gospel. So I'm not going to tell you that I can explain to you the genetics. I can tell you that I have been reading about the genome research. So. And as, as a non-geneticist, I can tell you that credible, non-Christian, even atheist geneticists are saying that there's all sorts of possibilities we have not thought about. And if you're if you're reading that if you're reading someone who's saying it's impossible for for the whole human race to stem from two, you're reading someone who is is uh, stating a personal opinion that is yet to be verified. So I'd like to re uh, re rephrase what you just yeah. said. Um, when a researcher publishes a work that is saying that we did not come from two people in an opinion. But when you as yourself have said that you are not a geneticist, say that we did come from Adam and Eve, it is a fact. Well, I, I, think, I, I think I've been pretty clear here that I'm expressing my beliefs. Yeah, and I, I do take it as a fact, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do take it as a fact. You know, we've had an interesting, uh, usually in these discussions, uh, it's all the adults, and then we have to encourage the kids. I think it's because you brought your kids, and we're seeing lots of questions from kids. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off the kids here and start hitting the adults, but I'll get to you a little bit later. I'm right here, sir. Okay. We, uh, we had this conversation last time. We talked a little bit, so let's see if we can develop it a little further. Uh, Remember, you're not having a conversation, right. but you're asking I, questions. I have questions for okay. you. I find the use of, um, I find... Uh, the secularist uh, position on morality curious. First question, do you believe science, can you, can you provide any sort of double-blind experiment that demonstrates a moral principle? Or anything in science that demonstrates a moral principle? Um, I would say that you're familiar with philosophy and I believe that, can I just give my answer on morality? Okay. Um, I believe morals should go through a rubric of three considerations. Okay. One is consequentialism, one is reciprocity, and, one, and the other one is individual rights. And some of them are obviously dealing with one, some of them have all three things that interplay. So it's, it's philosophy, philosophy of ethics. Right. I'm not claiming this is something you find in a lab, but I'm saying through a reason, and you have to know what the target is. The target is human flourishing or just right. flourishing in general. Right. Yeah. Right, and my question is, how did you arrive at those particular criteria? Because it, I don't see any, mm -hmm. anything other than a subjective that you like those criteria. How did you arrive at them? Okay, so the bottom line is, it, it, it goes down to the question of what is good and bad. Good, good is uh, what leads to flourishing and good feelings. Bad is what leads to pain and bad things. So for example, uh, why is it bad to hit somebody I don't like, just or, or kill them? Because I wouldn't want them to do that to me. Um, why is it good, and because it doesn't feel good and I don't want to lose my life, I want to enjoy my life. Um, and so if you know what good and bad is, then you develop a roadmap to get there. And let's say there's, let's say there's a moral question, should we do this, this, or this? Well, which one, which one is going to lead to flourishing and which one is going to lead to destruction? So it's, Right, and, but you're willing to admit that, that is, it's, that's your subjective, you like those particular criteria, that it's not based on reason, they're not self-evident, they're well, just your actually, particular choice. I think it actually is self-evident, and I think Christians also do it without realizing it. For example, uh, there's this 
question called the problem of evil. Why do bad things happen to good people? And one of the Christian answers usually is, well, you know, in the end it will all be made right anyway. Well, why is that? Well, because in the end we want everything to be good. It's consequentialist thinking. So... Define self-evident. Um, self-evident is obvious to everybody. Yes, and do you think those criteria are obvious to every human being that's existed throughout history? Because to, to hold, because you're putting a very, very high, making a high claim that something's self-evident. Most philosophers think the only things that reach the level of self-evidence are maybe math, maybe geometry, maybe the basics of logic. So you're making a claim that these things are self-evident, and I think you have a long ways to go to get there. I think ultimately your morality, like, like um, uh, virtually anybody that has a naturalistic worldview, is just based on your emotions. You like those things. No, if they're no, not I, more rational. Oh, they're I just your... No, I specifically go against going on emotions and feelings, and that's why I said there's three categories, rubrics right. that I give, and that way you bite. That way you learn not to go with your feelings because your feelings could be wrong. I mean, for example. Uh, gay rights, for example. Some people say, like, right. hey, homosexuality is just icky to me. It's like, it, that's not even a factor in ethics. It has to do with consequentialism, uh, reciprocity, and, free, and individual rights. So if you think, well, okay, well, there's bad consequences of homosexuality, okay, let's discuss it. What are the consequences? But, but, but saying how you feel makes me feel icky. Sorry, that doesn't enter. Let, let's take equality, because that's the big, the big one that I think secularists are, are uh, you know, um, I'm concerned about. You give me an argument for how somebody that particularly may maybe have a worldview that believes the right, the 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 the, the, uh, the uh, power and the uh, strength and the the uh, destiny of the right is more important than equality. Give me an argument, not just appealing to you're you're claiming they're self-evident. Mm -hmm. These terms are self-evident. I'm saying you haven't shown that they're self-evident. So give me an argument for how you, how you would argue against somebody that, that has some sort of, say, Nazi worldview. Okay, so somebody says Nazism is uh, good at the expense of, uh, you're saying we, sh we should kill people in the name of Nazism because it's, it's best, right? Yes. Okay, so number reciprocity violates that, red flaring play. I don't want people killing me, so I shouldn't be killing other people. Individual rights, I buy their individual rights by killing them out of the blue. Consequentialism, what kind of a government do you want that goes around doing that? But you still haven't made an argument that's based on nothing more than your subjective liking of those principles. I'm not hearing an argument. Somebody that lives in Nazi Germany may not like those principles the same way you do. But what All I'm hearing is just, just an assertion without any no, argument see, behind the assertion. I think if I were to argue with them, they would give an argument of consequentialism. They would say, look, if we do this, we're going to make a better world. And I would say, okay, that's, that might be one aspect. But let's look at all of the aspects on your consequentialism, but let's also add the individual rights and reciprocity. I, I'm saying let's have a more comprehensive look at this ethical issue. It's, it's ethical, it's ethics. Again, I'm not hearing an argument. I'm just okay, hearing... We're, we're, we've gone around this. We're going okay. to move on to someone else. Okay, you, but you, the sir, point is there sir, is no, there's no, no, no thank argument Thank you. Here. Thank you. We've got several others. Okay, uh, Gavin. Even though I'm a Christian and a naturalist, I kind of like the comment that was made earlier, so I'm going to play Christian advocate, not devil's advocate, but Christian advocate. <laughs> And that is, um, earlier you said, when asked a question about what's good or what's bad, you were saying, well, I wouldn't like it if someone hit me. I, it would, I wouldn't like that feeling, so I, so I wouldn't want to hit someone else. But then later on, you said that your values of good and bad are not based upon feelings. Is there a contradiction then? That you're deciding what's good based upon your feelings about different things. It feels good to me, therefore it's good. It seems to feel good to others, therefore it's good. But other people might think it's not good. Someone might be sociopathic, or they might be a sadist, or a masochist, or want to commit suicide, and different things would seem good to them at, at that moment. Or wanting to save a victim. So, so yeah, here's, here's my answer to that. Uh, as far as feelings, if I said, 
Okay, look, I'm the President of the United States. We have an ethical issue here before us. How should we, how, okay guys, let's get together and decide what's the ethical thing here. Three people say, oh, I think that's icky. Two people say, no, it's good. Okay, that's how we all feel, okay. No, that's not reasoning. Um, when I say take into account feelings, I'm talking about um, your physical feelings. I mean, it hurts to get pinched, it hurts to get stabbed, it hurts to get, it hurts to get hurt. I mean, you don't go around hurting people. Why? Because you don't want them to hurt you. Those are, those are causing pain. So that's the goal we're trying, that's the, that's the end goal, good and bad. We're trying to reduce pain, trying to maximize happiness, you know. And as far as some people might be liking pain, you know, those are called psychopaths. And so we look at the, the big picture and try to say most healthy people, the vast majority of people, they want to they flourish. Yes, there's suicidal people out there, there's people that enjoy hurting themselves and all that. We don't look at psychopaths for, you know, a, a valid thought process. Um, right here, you have a, yes. Sweet. Thank you okay. for <laughs> um, Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, well, my question was, it kind of goes back to what Pastor Liz was talking about, subjectivity in our observations. But that's basically, like, I want to make sure I, I heard you right. Like, basically, like, we observe the world around us and through kind of a broken pair of glasses, you could say. Right? That's kind yeah, of... Yeah, I, I have no problem with what you're saying. Sure. Okay, okay. So that's why we can't always... <clears throat> <clears throat> That's why you're saying like we can't always rely always on science for how we for what we believe in. Right, because science is given to us by scientists. Right. Yeah. But the Bible is given to us by preachers. Like I mean the thing is like <laughs> well, I mean, that, okay, that's my point. That's my point. I'm trying to equal that. See Bernie's Bernie's telling you that science is objective, mm -hmm. but the theologians are subjective. Well I'm okay. saying that's that's just So then you're saying both of them are subjective. Well, well, I, case, I didn't use the word subjective, okay. but I, I'm not against it. Okay. Yeah. So if that's the case, and then, you know, we can only see the world in one way, like through one pair of broken glasses, that's all we have. What do you feel gives Christianity more merit to look? Like, when, because even though science might be, there might be a bias to it, and there might be some parts about it that, like, you can't totally rely on. I know if I drop my phone, it's going to hit the ground because it's evidence. Because I have done that before, and it always has dropped to the ground. And in just the same way, you know, the most prominent and well-respected intellectual institutions in the world, if you go to the National History Museum, they're going to be talking about evolution. You know, like, I mean, most of the, you know, most of those institutions believe in things like evolution, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence based on, um, geological findings against a global flood. So why is it that I would use my reasoning, or like my like if I have to use my flawed reasoning, why would I turn to the Bible where you have to find so many loopholes and like you have to make it like, you know, try to make reconcile all of these things when I could be turning to science which has actually been tested and even if it might not be completely true, we at least have a general idea of a theory that we know works. Yeah, and that's, that's what has been underneath most of the conversations here. For example, tonight, no one has stated to me any hard published science. We've talked about it, but right down to Bernie's child, we have actually quoted scripture, the Bible. Why is that? Because Christianity claims that the Bible is actually the very word of God revealed to us. And many of us believe that it is the very Word of God revealed to us, and we have found it to be of a different category. And so it comes down to a matter of authority and submission. You see, you just gave this description of science as being actually quite reliable. But you have not given me any evidence for that. It's your assumption because that is what is being played generally uh, to us and given to us so that we all assume that the drumbeat, that the thrum, thrum, thrum <laughs> of the witch's heart is that it is reliable. And it's not. It's not any more reliable than anything else. If the Bible is merely man-made human writing, then it would be on the same plane as scientific research published evidence. 
You, you're making a lot of assumptions, Savannah, across the board. The difference is this. The Christian believes that the Bible is the very Word of God. Believes that the Holy Spirit of God has revealed to us that these are God's words for us. And so they're in a different category than any of the other good work that humanity has given. We put it in a completely different category. So you and, just and, have to presuppose a truth that you don't oh, have absolutely. evidence for. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. As, a, hu as a human being, you must submit to the divine authority. And you must presuppose. I'll tell you why. For no reason? The reason is that God has revealed himself to you. And I'll tell you what's happening in this room, Savannah. The, those who are atheists in this room are terribly, terribly concerned about the word of God. They keep quoting it. They keep talking about the stories. And they will tell you the reason why is they just can't believe that Pastor Nathan Lewis believes it. Why do they care about me? Why are they here tonight wondering about the biblical text? Because the claim has been made for millennia that it is actually the revealed word of God. That's a huge, that's a radical claim. That's what everyone's interested in here. Is there a God and did he really speak to us? It's, it's not about scientific evidence. It's not about great... People can be interested in other religions too. I mean, people can go to a mosque and if they don't believe just because they're interested in this truth that's been put forth. I think, you know, you have to come to the point, Savannah, where you, you decide what kind of a pilgrimage you're going to take on your life. Are you really interested in searching for truth? Then pray and ask God to give you as much time as you need. And I'm convinced that he will reveal himself to you. He will do that for you. You pray and ask him to do that, and he will reveal himself to you. Can I make a quick comment? Okay, go ahead. Um, you mentioned uh, Francis Collins. Like I said, there's this, there's this position in Christianity called evolutionary creationism. They have no problem with um, science at all because they say the Bible is not a scientific textbook. So, yeah, they 100% evolution. There was no Adam. There was no flood. And I think Francis Collins, I'm pretty sure, is in that group. He helped start Biologos.com. But a lot of Christians, evangelical Christians, don't know is there's a crisis in the academia, among the seminary professors and biologists, they're, they're trying to come to grips with this, and biologos.com, they, they, they have articles about this. They, they are saying there is no heaven even, how do we reformulate theology in light of this? And this is what I went through, and my, 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 my conclusion is that it is irreconcilable. I know the professor who wrote a book on it, and I know how he deals with it, and that is just basically going into a mysticism where it's like, it's all about Jesus, you read the Bible for anything good you can get out of it. If there's a problem, just tap, tap, you know, put it in the back of your mind. Someday when you get to heaven, God's going to answer all those questions. So it's just all about a relationship with Jesus. You know, That's all it is. And for me, it's like, you no, know, if God made us with brains, I think he wants to use it. And if you don't use it, I mean, I should even be insulting him because he gave you this powerful thing. So I, I did not want to put my brain on hold. So that was just me. Now, just, I'm going to... I'm going to, the lady in the back can get you next, but I just want to, Nathan, ask a question. Bernie just said, God gave you a brain, he thinks you ought to use it. You would agree with that, right? <laughs> yeah, and, okay. you know, my, my window of opportunity for doing that is decreasing every day. Okay, <laughs> and our window for opportunity for answering questions is decreasing, so in the back, please. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dealer, I believe you say believe in fact and science, correct? So, the second law of thermodynamics states that everything gets worse, is decomposes, um, you know, continually breaks down. How do you reconcile that to the theory of evolution? This is a law, not a theory. Yeah, so the idea is basically, um, it's common, kind of a common thought that, yeah, things run down from order to disorder. Um, the, the idea is that in a closed system, that's the way it is. Now, scientists aren't even sure if the universe is a closed system or not. For sure, the solar system is not a closed system. So, for example, consider how huge the sun is and how small the Earth is. All the energy thrown off by the sun and the little teeny, teeny bit that finally hits the Earth is a fraction of that. And so, it's like we're going up here, uphill in development. 
But if you look at overall, it's all downhill as far as heat dissipation and waste of energy. Um, now, just an easy way to, to show you that it's possible is you can't say like, well, I believe everything just runs down. I mean, you know, you, you can see this in everyday life. You see a baby being born in a woman's body. Now, you probably know that's a natural thing. There's nothing supernatural going on there, but you're seeing this complexity develop. There was no brain, now there's a brain. There was no fingers, now there's a finger. There was no nose, now there's a nose. There was no neurons, and all these neurons start appearing. So you see this development happening. Is that a violation of the second law of thermodynamics? Of course not. So, just because, that's kind of like saying, uh, it's impossible to coast uphill on a bicycle. Is it impossible to coast uphill on a bicycle? No. If you, if you came from a really high spot, to pick up a lot of speed, you can very easily coast uphill. So you have to look at the big picture, and, and, and when you look at the big picture, it's not a violation of the second law of the law that you mentioned. Okay, question. Why are atheists bad? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't believe that atheists are bad, because I believe atheists are made in the image of God. So they are highly valued people. I gave to you uh, and the rest here tonight a list of weaknesses, and the reason I did is that your daddy asked me to do it in preparation for this. <laughs> my idea was that I would speak to the strengths and weaknesses of my faith system, and your dad would do it for his. But there, I was forced to give you a list, and I'll stand by my list, Weston. But just because there's weaknesses in someone's faith system, I don't for a moment believe that your dad is any of less value than me. And I respect him, and I consider him to be a friend. And because you're his son, I think the same of you. Because you're in relationship together, and that's a value to me. Okay, uh, how about uh, right here? Uh, my mic, was it? Yes. Yeah. I got stuck, uh, Pastor Lewis, on the very first thing he said oh. when you were talking about the strength of your position. He said, God is gracious and just. And I'm thinking back to my Old Testament Bible stories. Thinking back to Exodus, and I'm remembering that God killed all the firstborn of Egypt. And then he ordered the genocide of some of the peoples that were living in the Promised Land about 40 years later. And it's never made sense to me how these were gracious and just actions. Can you explain that? Yeah, they, some of those uh, just actions were gracious for other people. Like uh, some of the people who were slaughtered uh, were part of a culture that was oppressive and harmful to other people. And so, um, I can't always figure out, I'm not saying that every single action is, for me, both just and gracious from God's hand. But I do know that God is, by what he says in the, in, in the scripture, that he is both just and merciful. That he is infinitely just and infinitely merciful. And that he has poured out much justice and much mercy. And sometimes one action of God is both. Okay, uh, come up right back there. Yes. Um, yeah. Bernie, uh, you said that uh, the, the basis of Christianity failed uh, on logical grounds. But then you said that how it failed is a jury would not find it uh, nice. And that seems to me not logical, but more pathetic. Um, more like, what? More pathetic, of the argument rooted in pathos. We do not find this pleasant, someone dying for us. But it does not disprove the logic behind it. So can you tell me how? A jury not liking someone, uh, a, uh, someone dying in the place of someone else, how that is logical? Um, so basically, in a court of justice, just, courts are there for justice. So there's, there's ethical theory, you know, what is the right punishment or whatever. Um, I, I think, I forget how you phrased it, you said that the court 
I can't remember what you said, but basically, this is what courts are experts at. They're experts at figuring out what's just. And I'm saying, we no, nobody, I don't think, I don't understand how anybody could, if there was a judge, let's say for example, uh, this guy killed somebody, and he goes before the judge and says, I'm sorry, and I, I did it and all that, I confess, and, and his dad says, okay, well I'm going to take the punishment for him, you can kill me instead. Nobody would want to see that happen. They would say, what's going on here? This, this is not justice, or this is not any kind of, this is some kind of weird thing going on, what's going on here? This, this makes no sense to kill somebody for somebody else's sin. I or, just, I don't right. see, I, I see how it offends your sensibilities, but I don't see how your sensibilities, your, uh, your feelings, your, your, your emotions, I don't see how that logically disproves it. They're like, oh, nobody likes to see that. I don't see how you can say, therefore, logically, that is false. Or it's wrong. I'm trying to say it's disgusting because there's no logic for it. I mean, it's not just me. I think it's everybody would be appalled by that. Well, I mean, if you gave me two minutes, I could, I could tell you the logic of it. Okay. But someone would have to say, Nathan, <laughs> would you please tell Bernie <laughs> to tell you the logic of it? Well, two minutes is kind of long, but it didn't give a really good <laughs> Well, someone up there would have to ask. Okay. Actually, we're going to, uh, my next question, <laughs> since, since we've had both uh, Bernie's sons ask a question, my next question is going to be from Ben. I was just going to say, um, you said that... Which is Nathan's son, for the rest of the world. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that the father would take... Like, the fa like if the son was convicted and was going to be killed, and then the father took his place, are you saying that he wouldn't take... Like, if you had the option to take the place of your son in death, you wouldn't do that? Because it's theological? I'm trying to say a judge would never allow that, because he would say, my, my job here is to make sure justice is taken care of, and... This is not justice. Where would you even get this idea? Oh, well, the ancients had this idea. What do you mean the ancients had this idea? <laughs> oh, yeah, they used to think uh, we, we had thunder and lightning or floods the other day, and there was an angry God, so we, we threw a virgin in the volcano and worked. Okay, that's why you're doing that. You're trying to appease the God. But we're not, we don't do that anymore. That's ancient. That's thousands of years ago. Why are you, what sense does it do? I mean, what kind of a judge would do that? Okay, right here. I'd like to give up my original question and ask Nathan to explain the logical aspect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you. I was hoping someone would do that. See, this is a good example of, of how atheism can't see beyond this because of its individualism. Uh, the logic in Christianity has to do with a term that is called covenant, which means we're in a relationship with God. And it is all based on His law. And he says, I am the divine party, and you are the human party. And you have to obey my, my law as the human party. And so this is the incarnation. The human party has failed. And so God sends his son to be the representative for the human party to perfectly obey his law and to perfectly absorb the condemnation for the sinful human party. If you see it in the relational, legal terms of the biblical story and the biblical law, it makes per it, it's perfectly logical. It's all you, but you would have to study the covenant law, and you would have to study it from the the perspective of those who who present it. Uh, it is not like uh, throwing a virgin into the volcano. But I'm glad to hear that you think it is illogical for a father to give up his life for his son. So, Benjamin, don't be expecting anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, can I just put two quick comments yeah, on that? One, one quick comment is that it might be philosophically uh, coherent within that system, as you said. But then again, too, you might say, well, I believe, uh, you know, let me, let me give a, a different alternative perspective because I'm a Jedi Knight in the Jedi religion, and, you know, it's perfectly philosophically consistent in that religion. Or, you know, the Harry Potter series or some other series. So, we're talking about modern ethics, and uh, when, uh, how, you, how do you explain, I guess, giving modern ethics, if somebody deserves punishment, somebody else takes it in their place? 
That's the whole issue, taking punishment for somebody else in their place. That's the issue. Yeah, I don't think you explain that. But, but see, Jesus did not take our place in the 21st century. Sure he did. No, he did in the fullness of time. He did it a little bit more than 2,000 years ago. Right. And he did it under a covenant law that was still well known in his Judaism. And he did it in a, in, in a context where it was still in play. That is all for the Christian finished work. We look back on that. We're not saying in some way God is going to do that now. He's already done that for us now 2,000 years ago. So are you saying back then it would have been okay too for a, for a father to die for his son back, back in those My days? My point is that it, was, it would probably be uh, not lost on the larger community as it's lost on you today. And I, would, I understand why it's lost on many people. It's what the Apostle Paul says, even in the first century, it's the offense of the cross. The cross is offensive. Paul, the Apostle Paul never presents the cross of Jesus Christ as something that is just, oh, we should just accept this at face value. Nothing really, nothing really radical happened here. Oh, oh, this happens every day. Okay, right here, sir. So before you answer, if Bernie, maybe you could uh, restate the question. Restate the question. Did you understand it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there there are multiple questions. Um, I can pick on one of the one of the questions. Um, one of the questions I think he was hitting at was, um, what if you what? If, it, it kind of let me rephrase it, put it in a different light. What if you? Um, okay, so basically, I said for ethics, there's three things to consider: consequentialism. Um, reciprocity and individual free rights. Uh, let's say, for example, I could rob a bank and I knew for certain I would never get arrested. Uh, would I do that? Well, you know, consequentialism, I might say like, well, you know, there's not that big of consequences for the government. I mean, they'll, they'll recover. I've had a lot of money. Maybe I could do good with the money. Uh, reciprocity um, and individual rights. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I could... Uh, I don't know. So, so one of the one of the perplexing things is, there is what if you can get away with it? Um, but I think in reality, that's the one thing you can never think because people always think you're going to get away with crime. They usually get caught, you know. Um, so I would just say that when, you know you just have to assume that part of the equation is that, that you're never going to have a situation where you know you can get away with something for sure. So I guess maybe the bottom line is that ethics are are difficult. I mean, some of them are easy. Number one, like, for example, um, Nathan, or, and some people might say, like, well, rape is, there's absolute morals. Everybody knows rape is wrong. Well, why is it? It's just because it's so extreme. and so obviously uh, against reciprocity. It's so obvious against uh, consequentialism. It's so obvious against um, individual free rights. It's just, it's a glaring bomb of why it's so bad. And why is it good that, to feed somebody who's starving. Well, because we know it feels like to be starving. It's so, it's so obvious, it's so extreme. 
there's a whole bunch of ethical issues that are in the middle that are very complicated to figure out. And, well, we have to try to sort through it. I don't see how it helps to say, look in the Bible. Well, there's no answer in the Bible for that specific problem anyway. What are you going to do? Pray to God for an answer? I don't think God's going to give you an answer. I don't think there is a God. Well, but who holds so. somebody accountable for, for example, if there were a tyrant all their lives, and uh, what do you call that? Uh, you know, they had a harem of 300 women. If he could uh, take their daughter, you know, but he dies a natural death. You know, it's like, uh, why why not uh, do all, everything uh, unscrupulous that you can you know, to, to get ahead? Why have rules that, in war, like uh, don't use uh, you know, prisoners and slave labor? Well, that's, I mean, those, those, those two examples seem like reciprocity. I mean, you don't, want the, you don't want them to do that to you, so you don't do that to them. You know, Jesus said that, do unto others as you want them to do unto you, and Confucius says a couple hundred years, I believe, or more before Jesus. So that's one of those things that it just makes sense, you know, for reciprocity. Daniel. My son. I, I do have a question for you, Bernie, is, I mean, just to, going back to what you said about sacrifice and how no judge would ever um, accept that, are you basing that purely on our American legal system or on some sort of other legal system? I mean, I know it's in the American legal system, but is that the only legal system you're using? Well, yeah, I would have, you know, I'm thinking you know, American or British or basically, we are de 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 developed nations, ones who have academics, ones who study philosophy for, you know, the hundreds of years that philosophy has been going on. You know, what can we expect from a developing nation when they, they don't even, you know, they could barely read and write sometimes, or, you know, they, they have their right of corruption and all kinds of other problems. But we have a level of maturity that is a lot more academic than everything, politics and government. So so do we have um, more of a right to tax judgment than underdeveloped nations because we have more schools and more money and more technology. I mean they can they can pass judgment but who are we to say that they're not correct just because we read more books? Yeah so for example let's say a, a Muslim nation says oh we wanted to um, Follow the Old Testament. We talked about this in a previous debate. In the Old Testament it says that if a guy takes a woman as a wife and finds out she's not a virgin, he can have a return and basically stone her. You know, she's, and, and you know, you, you can't even, for technical reasons, you can't even really tell if a person is a virgin or not anyway. But this this was actually in the news not too long ago. Um, a Muslim guy married some woman and what wasn't you know as part of his group. He had all the other wives and he wanted to return her because he said she she wasn't a virgin and. Um, is that, can our group, can our, can our group pass judgment on that? Well, you know, when you look at reciprocity, considering women as equals, yeah, obviously. Uh, and, and we would argue that we have better morals than they do. So, we have better moral reasoning than they do. I would argue, yeah, we have better, I, I think if you, if we have that rubric, what I talked about, consequentialism, individual rights, and uh, reciprocity, I think that's superior to, uh, a Muslim or a Christian who says, well, I just believe the holy book and that's my source, or, you know, the guy with all the money or whatever. I think it's superior. But it pleases them to do this. It, it is within their standards of justice to do this. It's their way of doing things. And I mean, it doesn't affect us, so why should we bomb? I mean, it's well, I don't think they would. I don't think they would do that if they had a democracy. So part of the abnormal there is that they got somebody who's you know a power and he's abusing his power. I think if they got together and said, "This here's a problem. Let's all talk about it together," and they considered women and men as equals, they would come up with different answers. Okay, let's see. Somebody else that hasn't asked a question yet. Uh, what's that? If, if Five minutes run, left on tape. That's, uh, that's okay, we just let it run dry. Sure, sure. Uh, to change taxes a little bit, I have a question about presuppositions, and it kind of has two forms for you, Bernie. Um, one, you have your three pillars of ethics, and 
I want to know how you arrive at those three pillars. And I would say that there's a little presupposition in there. Also, you come you saying that um, facts and science are the way to go. How do you arrive that those are the way to go? And I would argue that those are presuppositions. And I would ask you how they're not. Yeah, so basically in my study of moral philosophy, I, I learned uh, from the secular humanist, there was a leader, his name was Paul Kurtz, and he was really big on consequentialism. So it's like, okay, that sounds good. But then I found it didn't really cover all the cases. And I found that some people believe in reciprocity, and they think everything boils down to that. And I can see how that applies in some cases, but not other cases. And then I saw myself, this is my own self-study, how some issues uh, also involve individual rights, which seem to be a little different plane than the other two. So I'm thinking whenever I have a methical, ethical issue to, to, to do it, those three things have helped me. So I would say from experience and trying to run some things through this hypothesis that I have, I like the way it sorts out. So by reason, you come to these three standards. Yeah, by reason. Once you understand the goalpost, then you get the reason to get there. So the goalpost is what's good and bad. And once you understand that, then it's like, what's the map, the best map to get there? Right. So why can you use reason to come here? Like, what in your thinking allows reason to bring these facts? Yeah, so, so basically, like I said, it's like a map. If I said I want to go from here to my house, I can go directly or less than directly or all the way around the world. So the most direct path is the best one ethically. So Wait, Maybe I can rephrase is there anything before reason? Well, I mean, that's a general question. Maybe it'd be more specific. Okay. Um, so you see reason as a good way to think about things, right? That mm -hmm. makes sense, and you can reason through ethics by mm -hmm. using reason, right? Yeah. It's a little, it's a little weird. I'm about. Bear with me. But why is reason such a good system? I guess it's, sometimes it's a matter of all the alternatives. What do you have besides reason? Let's look at all the other alternatives. And the major one from religion is divine messages or divine inspiration. And I'm saying that's the most unreliable, worthless way of trying to get any kind of information whatsoever. So if you throw out divine revelation, what do you have left? And that's what you have reason. I mean, you can have feelings, and I'm, I'm saying don't go by feelings because it's based on subconscious processing in your brain. I'd rather use the conscious processing. So that's what reason is, conscious processing. Okay. So did you just use reason to try and prove why reason is good? Sure. Yeah. OK, I'm going to see yeah. uh, there's another perspective sized question. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, OK. Well, just one little quick question, too. I think also that history shows that this is a good way to do it. I, 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 I'm not picking reason to support reason just for the heck of it. It's also because it's been shown successful through history. So. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, yeah, could I, could I get each of you to comment on one of the other logical failings that you've heard me point out? You reference original sin and the statement that you make there is making uh, children accountable for the crimes of their parents or whatever. Um, I, I think that it's very well recorded throughout history of man's inhumanity and injustice against man. So, Nathan, how would the gospel explain that? And yeah, Bernie, well, and Bernie, how would science and reason explain that? Bernie, Bernie doesn't understand the doctrine of original sin as okay. it's been taught. It's, uh, <laughs> the doctrine of original sin is that the human race as a whole is now living broken under the common curse that there is no part of, of, the, of, the, of the human person, none of our faculties have been un, unscathed by that sin. So my will is just as broken as my body, so on and so forth. So that's the doctrine of original sin. It, the doctrine of original sin doesn't say that I'm being held accountable for Adam and Eve's sin. It just says because I'm part of the race of Adam and Eve, I am in this condition that they produced. The doctrine of actual sin is what I commit or fail to do that is right. And for that I am held responsible with, with legal consequences. These are, the, these are basic Christian doctrines that have been extrapolated from 
numerous scriptures across the board and put together. So but right here, Bernie on the slide is just playing fast and loose with a system he just doesn't know. That's all. Well, I mean, we say basic Christian stuff. That's um, Catholicism is by far the larger, largest denomination. And I mean, they had all kinds of weird things, like if you didn't baptize the baby, it's going to limbo, and then they got rid of limbo because it didn't really make sense, and mm -hmm. they still wanted to baptize, and they got purgatory, and they got indulgences to get you out of purgatory, and you don't believe any of that stuff. So, no. So, Bernie has been part of two churches that have, uh, have bought into consumerism. He's, he, he's part of the Roman Catholic Church, who's made a lot of money in history, by making a lot of people feel guilty so that they will buy their way out. And then he's been part of a mega church here in our community that has, at that point when he was part of it, wholesale into consumerism. What, what is snappy and what is popular and what's going to make me feel good. So I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know that in neither of those places were you given a biblical doctrine of, the, of original sin or actual sin. Okay, to answer the question too from the, yeah, from the atheist viewpoint, um, it all, you know, as far as I'm concerned, of course every atheist has their own belief. I'm not trying to speak for all atheists or all secular humanists, but the way I clearly see it is that it has to do with evolution. Evolutionary is, is my origin story and it explains so much. This is, look at what animals do. I mean, you got tigers and lions and bears fighting for territory. Uh, look at the bonobos and the monkeys and the apes and how they act. There's certain tribal actions. I mean, first there's the individual, the family, and the tribe, and now we have nations. Uh, so that man's in humanity to man, it just follows the pattern. And hopefully we, we progress to a intellectual maturity to understand that we all are all, you know, related. We're all humans. You know, it's not one tribe against another tribe. So, I mean, I, so I think evolution it perfectly explains why man is in human rather than so. Okay, we're right at our, our end now. Uh, there are several hands that have been raised. Some of you have uh, had a chance, some of you haven't had a chance, but there will be plenty of time afterwards to interact with uh, each other and with the speakers. But we're in our closing moments here. Uh, we're gonna, Bernie's going to have one minute to summarize uh, his position, followed by Nathan with a minute to summarize his. Go ahead, Bernie. Okay. Um, one thing I want to say is I hope I didn't offend anybody. I'm trying to explain what my, you know, my viewpoint is, and I understand that it's, uh, it could be alarming to somebody else. I mean, for me, I don't think um, God exists, just like I don't think Santa Claus exists. To me, they're both imaginary characters, um, especially the God of the Bible. I mean, there's different kinds of gods, a philosophical God and all that, a uh, philosopher's God, and you know, there's Yahweh and Jesus and Thor and all these other gods. Um, so anyway, I, I want to say I hope I didn't offend anybody, but this is my viewpoint, and I'm glad that we can respectfully uh, disagree. And as the person over here said, I do really think it's a matter of uh, seeking the truth and <coughs> dealing with the consequences as they fall. And I, I heard Pastor Nathan talk about the consequences, like, oh, it may be depressing or not. And I didn't have a chance to talk about that, but I don't think the emotions are useful for determining truth. And I think we need to determine the truth first and deal with the consequences that come out of that. And the biggest consequence by far is the challenge is the dealing with mortality, which is a different subject. So. Well, I, I do agree with my friend Bernie on our, our need to really search, to research, to, to find out what the truth is. And if you seek for the truth, you'll find it. Uh, especially if you pray and ask the Holy Spirit of God to guide and direct you. You say, well, I don't believe that such a person exists. Well, pray and ask, God, if you exist, reveal yourself to me. I will say this, that I am, I am uh, interested in my emotions and my feelings, as well as my thoughts. Believe me, it bothers me in our community when I hear people say over and over and over again, well, what I feel is this. I say, don't you ever think? <laughs> yeah, I, so I want to use my mind, but I'm a whole human being. And I also have feelings, I have emotions, I have experience. And so all of these qualities 
are important. And truth is not simply a little data byte that pops off my brain, that interacts with my brain as if I were a, a computer. Truth addresses information.